Good morning, everyone. It is December 22nd, um, and we are back in the ceremonial courtroom here in Cobb County. Thank you to our hosts. We are live streaming, and um, our understanding from the hearing panel in the Judge Cooper matter is that uh, we are going to receive closing arguments or summations from the two sides. Mr. Boring, yesterday, first of all, good morning. Good morning. Are you feeling better? Uh, it's moved around a bit. Okay. All right. Um, I'm, well, I just popped a couple of days, Will, so we're we motivated by 1030. Okay. <laughs> They'll have taken effect by then. Good. Um, so yesterday you told us that you were going to reserve all your time to give effectively a responsive summation after Judge Coomer's team. <laughs> That's correct. Still the plan? Yes. Sir. Okay, great. And then Mr. Lefko, I think it was you, one of you or one of your colleagues asked, can we divide it up? Answer remains yes. Um, you've got an hour once you all get started. Do you need any technical, you, you usually don't need any technical assistance, but will I need to be toggling between the camera and a PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, I have a PowerPoint. Yes. Okay. We can make that happen. Will that be, okay, we can make that happen. When you're ready. Um, it has been an honor of my legal lifetime to be here in front of this panel um, and representing my friend, Christian Coomer, um, next to Joe Kingwa and Dennis Cathy, and with uh, Pamela Bospo da Silva, who is on her way to go into law school herself in the country here. Um, and against formidable adversaries. Um, I, while we haven't agreed on anything, on everything here, um, one thing I greatly appreciate is that my dad could watch this trial on YouTube, um, which was quite a, an experience. Um, is he one of those live commentators who keeps saying, no. left cow, do this? No, <laughs> he, he just uses a cell phone to do that. Um, Mr. Philhart, is what started this case. And he entered into loans with his friend, Christian Coomer, before Judge Coomer was a judge. And he did that because he wanted to, not because he was convinced to do that by anybody. He's a determined guy who marches to his own drum. Um, he had his own financial strategy. And while these loans looked a little odd to the outside, um, and a 30-year loan for a gentleman who's in his 70s does look God to the outside. Um, he had his own financial strategy here. He didn't need the money. He wanted to lend money to his friend, and it couldn't hurt to have a state politician who he thought owed him favors, and a lawyer who he thought owed him favors. He knew he could get security for the loan, but he didn't ask for it from Mr. Coomer because he didn't think he needed it. Um, he asked for it from his girlfriend because he didn't trust her, but he trusted Mr. Coomer to pay him back. And he was right to trust him. He was happy to receive a steady source of income, untaxed monthly income to supplement his social security and his pension. After about a full year of living off of those payments, he changed his mind, perhaps because he was mad that Judge Coomer could no longer do free legal work for him since he was a judge, perhaps because he was mad about his heat pump, perhaps because his financial advisor convinced him he could make more money investing with him. And then he lost $300,000 on the market like everybody else this year. Once Mr. Philhart changed his mind, he fell into the absolute wrong hands for this. Um, he fell into the hands of people who would try to make this odd situation look like it was a fraud and make it worse. He fell into the hands of people who would make up stories about a phone call before filing suit instead of trying to work things out between friends. People who would use Mr. Philhart as a prop to get their own names in the newspapers trying to take down a judge. The claims of fraud said more about what was in their hearts than what was in Judge Coomer's heart. Mr. Boring said in opening statement that Judge Coomer engaged in generally unethical and dishonest conduct as an attorney, a judicial candidate, and a judge. He disclosed in a witness statement that he would have two experts come here and say fraud, deceit, dishonesty, and misrepresentation on the stand. His experts would not agree. Mr. Boring tried to convince Mr. Philhart that Judge Coomer lied to him. Mr. Philhart would not agree. Then Mr. Boring tried to convince Judge Coomer he never even said the word fraud. He claimed that he had just twice gratuitously mentioned it in the formal charges, which he also didn't need to do. He could have just said a lawsuit was filed. 
Make no mistake, Mr. Boring said fraud because he wanted to say it. He took the baton from right gammon and used these false claims of fraud to get Judge Coomer's bank records with subpoenas, to instigate a campaign finance proceeding into Judge Coomer's legislative campaign, the results of which were ignored, and to cherry pick an entry in a mortgage application that was autofilled to make a claim of mortgage fraud so he could say the word fraud again. They have the wrong guy for whatever these claims are called. <clears throat> Judge Coomer is a good and decent man in every area of his life. He didn't do everything right as a person in every aspect of his life, but he didn't defraud anyone. He didn't try to hurt anybody. He wasn't dishonest and he wasn't deceitful and he's not any of those things. We heard from Colonel Lorraine Mink yesterday um, and one level below general in the United States Air Force. She said Judge Coomer's service to his country has been extraordinary and in the top 1% of officers she's encountered in her career. Anyone who has the character to do what Mr. Boring said Judge Coomer did, steal from people on purpose, set up things that help him steal from people has a character flaw that cannot be hidden for as long as Judge Coomer has been a good person. You can't tell me that Judge Coomer fooled Colonel Mink, all of his superiors who filled out officer performance reports in his 19 years of honorable service, and his law assistant, Kay Smith, in a two-person law office who worked with him all that time, all his peers in the legislature who elected him to majority whip, all of the people of the state of Georgia who elected him to court of appeals judge, his wife, legislator Matthew Gamble, his friend and private banker, Butch Emerson, and chief magistrate judge Brandon Bryson. Mr. Boring may not know what to call these claims, but I do. I call them wrong. They're absolutely wrong, and they're not the right person to make them against. I've got a PowerPoint that I want to go over some things, some portions of the evidence in this case. If I may switch. This case started with the investigation into the allegations of Mr. Philhart. Mr. Philhart alleged fraud. And that did warrant an investigation. Mr. Philhart again had his own financial strategy behind entering a 30 year loan. He said, quote, I didn't need the money at all. And what I did with this money that he paid each month, I simply didn't have to draw out for my living expenses, which is very little. I just used his, end quote. He also said, gratuitously, that's what I used to pretty well live on. That way my pension and social security was put in the bank and I never touched it. This was his strategy, his financial strategy for how he wanted to live his life. He wanted to give those loans, he wasn't duped into them. As far as how the investigation proceeded, investigator Alford admitted that he did not ask Mr. Philhart if he even read the loan documents. He's conducting a fraud investigation and he didn't ask whether he read the notes or wills or the estate planning documents. I asked him, did you, and you did not ask him whether he read the notes or the wills or the estate planning documents, or did you? He answered, I asked him if he knew what was in the notes, and he said, yeah, generally. That's not a fraud investigation. So when you have methods like that, you get wrong information. Mr. Philhart told investigator Alford, Judge Coomer did nothing wrong, and he was angry about getting taxed for the sale of his stocks. That's what Mr. Philhart told us. He said at that point, he had told investigator Alford that Judge Coomer did nothing wrong. He was just angry about his taxes. Investigator Alford didn't dispute this. I asked him, did Mr. Philhart tell you that Chris Coomer did nothing wrong and he was just angry about his taxes? He told me something that included that is what investigator Alford said. Investigator Alford did not ask Mr. Philhart if the wills were what he wanted. I asked him if he indicated whether the, the things that were in the wills were in conformance with Mr. Philhart's express wishes. He did not indicate whether that was true or not. Um, I asked whether he asked that. And Mr. Alford said, I did not phrase it that way. He didn't even ask that basic question. He also keeps a one-sided chronology we've seen portions of. And the title of that document is called Excerpts of Chronology of Events, but it only contains Mr. Philhart's side of the story. We sat with Mr. Alford for over an hour, probably hours, and told 
Judge Coomer told his side of the story. We didn't tell it for him. And none of it makes it into this chronology. It does not contain that exculpatory statement we talked about that Judge Coomer did nothing wrong and Mr. Philhart was angry about his taxes. The director's burden is clear and convincing evidence. And I think we can eliminate the first three, willful misconduct in office, persistent failure to perform the duties of office and habitual intemperance. What we're really dealing with is the last two. Now there's been no conviction of a crime, but there have been allegations of crimes that don't involve more moral turpitude. And the thing that really brings us here is this conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice, which brings the judicial office into disrepute. It is not a pre-qualification to be electable as a court of appeals judge that you've never done anything wrong in campaign finance. Um, that's not what the Constitution says. It's conduct by a judge prejudicial to the administration of justice, which brings the judicial office into disrepute. And then we've got the Code of Judicial Conduct 1.1, 1.2a, which are the allegations by um, Mr. Boring in the complaint and the formal charges that those are subject to the constitutional limitation that it has to be uh, uh, conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice as far as removal of a judge. Uh, Mr. Kathy has hard copies of dictionaries in his office and sent me pages. Um, and clear evidence or proof is that which is positive, precise and explicit, which tends directly to establish the point to which it is adduced and is sufficient to make out a prima facie case. Convincing evidence is such as is sufficient to establish the proposition in question beyond hesitation, ambiguity, or reasonable doubt in an unprejudiced mind. You're not suggesting that the burden is beyond a reasonable doubt. No. Because, I, well, that's it's close. In front of me. It's close. It's clear and convincing evidence. And I'm taking the dictionary definitions of what clear and convincing evidence is. What's odd about the standard is the standard is defined in relation to another standard of preponderance and just says it's higher than that. And so- And less than beyond a reasonable that's doubt, right. which is what right. you put in front of us. It's convincing and clear proof. Okay. The first, there are three pillars of the director's case in this, in this matter to try to prove that Judge Coomer committed some sort of deceit, dishonesty, and misconduct. And this first pillar is the better memory argument that's been made. Director Boring claimed in opening Mr. Philhart didn't remember things in his deposition, but he remembered better when he talked with investigator Alford. He said in opening statement that the deposition, you can just disregard the deposition because Mr. Philhart was just agreeing with everything everybody asked the way they asked it. And he said that Mr. Philhart was the one who volunteered, quote, my memory was much better back then. Whatever I told the people back in 2019, 2020, my memory was better and by God, it's true, end quote. That is not what happened at that deposition. And that's one of the reasons I filed that deposition because that's not what happened. It was Mr. Boring that was suggesting to Mr. Philhart that his memory was bad. Mr. Philhart didn't agree with even that basic premise in his testimony. He was asked by Mr. Boring to agree with this. He said, quote, was your memory better about what happened with when you talked to Wright and investigator Alford or a couple of months ago? And that's at his deposition. He responded, those memories were both about the same. The, what we just saw was a transcript from the deposition, not Mr. Nope. Philhart's testimony here. That was from the testimony here, transcript 1383 through 1384. So not at the deposition. Not at the deposition. He was disagreeing with the premise that a couple months ago at his deposition, his memory was worse than when he talked to the investigator. Director Boring suggested that Mr. Philhart didn't notice he entered into a 30-year loan because Judge Coomer promised to repay within a year. That was not true. Um, and this is where investigator Alford says that statement. Um, Mr. Mr. Alford said that Mr. Coomer had told Mr. Philhart that the loans would really be paid within a year. And that's why the terms weren't that significant to Mr. Philhart. Mr. Lefko, yes, sir. I understand that the documents say what the documents say though, right? They do. There's no dispute that the document was a 30 year term. Correct. Right. And so if there was ever a legal dispute that would ever arise from those documents, if, Mr. if Judge Coomer had said, I have 30 years to pay this, I don't 
I was a former trial judge. I don't think there's a trial court in Georgia that could say, well, they said he's going to, he said he's going to pay it in a year. So the verbal representation trumps the written de declarations that I, I don't think there's a case in Georgia that says that happens typically because most contracts contain that little clause that says that no outside verbal representations are going to alter the terms of this written document. Correct. Yes, sir. So if there'd ever been a legal dispute over the payment terms, wouldn't the 30 year term control the oh, uh, document yes. controls? Yeah, you're right. And it's, it goes back. There was a Fulton County judge who used to say it's the documents, it's the documents, the documents. I agree. And the point was that was being made by Mr. Boring was, and Mr. Alford is Mr. Philhart was duped into this. He just didn't notice what the actual document said because he thought something else was going to happen. And Mr. Philhart doesn't remember saying that is the point. He didn't remember saying that to Mr. Alford. Um, Director Boring suggested in the amended formal charges that Judge Coomer had convinced Mr. Philhart to sell his stocks. That was in page 58. Judge Coomer, quote, convinced Philhart to sell his investments to make the September 2018 loan, which resulted in a large tax liability for Philhart, end quote. Mr. Philhart said repeatedly, it was his idea. He said, that was my idea to sell stocks. Now, he did have to sell stocks to fund that loan. But again, that loan was something for him because he wanted a source of income at the end of when his Teamsters pension was going to dry up. This is when, and this is at Mr. Philhart's deposition. So let me go back. This is volume two of his deposition. And Mr. Philhart was adamant that it was his idea. Now, this is Mr. Boring questioning him. And he says, quote, again, your memory would have been better a couple of years ago as opposed to now. And it says Mr. Boring objective form. That was actually Mr. Lefko objective form. Mr. Philhart responded and, and resisted that notion that his memory was better back then. He said, quote, there's no mistake about that. If it was 20 years now, it would still be my idea. Nobody is going to tell me what to do with my portfolio. Now, he just disagreed with the basic premise I don't remember anything about this stock sale. Again, he testified at this trial, the decision to, to sell your stocks, was that your decision? He answered, yes. Problems with the better memory argument with Mr. Philhart. The fact that he told different versions of stories diminishes his credibility. Better memory stories are not clear and convincing evidence as well. And he's not a good candidate for this argument because his earliest known complaint about the loans to Brandon Bryson was not true. He told Brandon Bryson that Judge Coomer was supposed to be paying monthly and he wasn't paying. That was right when Judge Coomer was becoming a judge. Not only that, but Mr. Philhart said he called Mr. Coomer. And we've seen an email where Mr. the first thing out of, or one of the first things out of Mr. Philhart's email typewriter keyboard was don't call me we can't talk on the phone communicate with me in writing he said it again to mr bryson mr philhart did more than once he said payments were supposed to be made monthly and i haven't received any monthly payments but so we're clear even though some of these things say philhart this is bryson claiming philhart said that correct Better memory bad memory it's not Phil Hart saying these things. It's, That's right. It's Bryson. That is correct. Brandon Bryson was, Mr. Phil Hart consulted Brandon Bryson early in this process. Mr. Phil Hart was clear there was no failure to pay any monthly installment under the terms of the notes. Another thing that makes Mr. Phil Hart a bad candidate for this argument is he wants to use litigation to punish people. He said that on the stand. He had a dispute with the sister of his girlfriend that he got guardianship over. And because she teed you off because she said you were nasty, you wanted to sue her. And he said, I wanted to punish her for it by suing her. He said to, J to Kay Smith, per her testimony, that he wanted to ruin Judge Coomer. He told me, this is according to Kay Smith. He told me that he was going to take him down. He was going to ruin him. That's what his words were. The second pillar of the director's case is a supposition that Judge Coomer has bad character. And behind this storefront of good conduct in his entire lifetime 
he's just got, he's just a bad guy. And a supposition is an assumption that something is true without proof of its veracity. There was no witness here that came here and said, Judge Coomer acted anywhere else as a bad guy. He's just a bad actor. In every nook and cranny of his life, the people that really know him said that he's a good man. He's an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, Georgia State Representative. He was elected Majority Whip in the Georgia House of Representatives, Georgia Legislator of the Year, devoted family man, man of faith, Benham Award for Community Service, <coughs> statewide elected jurist, author of 233 Georgia appellate decisions, and participant in 399. This man has a lifetime of good conduct and deserves to wear a robe. The third pillar that the director bases his case of Judge Coomer being a fraudster is using things that have nothing to do with Mr. Philhart to try to prove the Philhart allegations. The, the basic equation is this. You take the Philhart issues, you add in mortgage allegations plus campaign finance allegations, and you get fraud on Mr. Philhart. And that's just not anything to do with anything. Those lack a logical specific link to the Philhart issues. What this case is not about is dishonesty, fraud, deceit, and misrepresentations. The director's opening, he said, Judge Coomer committed generally unethical and dishonest conduct. The expert disclosure said, we're gonna bring a witness here that says dishonesty, fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation. I'm gonna object if he keeps going into the expert summary. That's not before you offered this right here. That was a notice about possible topics and left their areas of expertise. Okay, but I think we admitted the expert summaries yesterday. I think it was just for the record. So, but okay, we'll give it the way it's due. Thank you. Um, the, the expert got on the stand and on Wadir said he's disinclined to say that there's deceit. He he was not inclined to say there was a misrepresentation either. He was not going to give an opinion that there was fraud. And he didn't read any depositions or understand any of the actual interactions between Mr. Coomer and Mr. Philhart. <clears throat> Mr. Philhart himself was asked whether he understood that he had filed a complaint against Judge Coomer for fraud. And he said, I don't know if that's fraud. I wouldn't call it fraud. He also seemed to be somewhat of a pawn in this. And I asked whether he would in his dep this is his deposition, by the way, um, volume two, page 90. I asked whether he was aware of the news reporting suggesting that Judge Coomer took advantage of him in light of his testimony that Judge Coomer did not take advantage of him. And he said, yeah, I read some of that stuff in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. It wasn't my idea to put anything in there. I don't know who put it in there. And I asked whether why he just let that all go. And he said, what could I do about it? They already had it in there. I'm not saying Mr. Philhart's a bad guy. I'm not. It's just some people, when they're angry, they say things they don't mean. And they might be willing to say things to get something that they want back. So I've got scorecards on these sections here. The weight of the evidence on fraud and deceit, no fraud. James Philhart said it twice, deposition and at trial. Judge Coomer said it twice. Others contending fraud did occur. Mr. Boring, which is not evidence. An unverified complaint by Mr. Gammon and witnesses with no opinion, their certified fraud investigator and Mr. Lundberg. There have been private conduct errors here and Judge Coomer's admitted them. And we wanna make clear what we're admitting here. Um, he did blur the lines between a friendship and an attorney client relationship, but make no mistake, it was a friendship. You don't know the things that Judge Coomer knew about Mr. Philhart without being friends. Mr. Boring questions whether they were friends because they didn't go out for drinks or whatever, but that doesn't necessarily, that's not the only way to be friends with people. Mr. Coomer did draft the will that designated him beneficiary. This was a beneficiary for convenience per the wishes of his friend who had done this very thing before. That did violate rule 1.8C. He entered loans with a friend and client or former client at times that should have had a personal guarantee or security to avoid the appearance of impropriety. You use the term former client. What, what's the line that you want us to draw as to when representation stopped, other than Judge Coomer 
became Judge Coomer, and so he couldn't have clients. I want you to draw the line where the evidence shows the line is drawn. Where I think, do you think at, the evidence draws that at, at different points, it's different. Um, they're more friends than attorney client after the guardianship case. Um, that line Coomer testified in great detail in response to your questions about all the work he continued to do for Mr. Philhart and didn't charge him for it after the guardianship. Where do you think the evidence says uh, Mr. Philhart became a former client? Because it's a different issue if he's a former yeah, client. That's right. I think when he becomes a judge, Judge Coomer becomes the judge, then Mr. Philhart better be a former client. But before that moment, do you think the evidence points to now you are technically, legally, officially a former client? I think it's maybe a little more nuanced than that. I think, you know, in some instances, it's 90% attorney or 90% friend, 10% attorney client. Um, the, the attorney client relationship was more incidental to the friendship overall. Um, I think on the December 2017 loan, I don't think there was active representation going on at that time. Arguably, there would have been minor things being done in March 2018 um, and September 2018. I don't think they had a bunch of active representation is my recollection, but there, there are uh, records that your honors can, or the panel can ferret out from the internal billing records that Judge Coomer kept and make that decision for yourselves. Um, I would just say in overall though, those little piddly things, as Mr. Boring called them, were incidental to the friendship. They're still lawyer client. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I yeah. don't think you want to ask us to rely on your client's billing records. He has effectively said, don't rely on them because I wasn't necessarily keeping them vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Philhart. So um, I'm going to take your answer as I'm not going to tell you where the defense thinks the line is drawn when that client relationship ended. Because I haven't heard you say other than it's variable, which is <laughs> it's it's blurry. It's the best answer. I think it's the same answer that Mr. Lundberg gave. Sometimes that line is blurry, and that <laughs> definitely was here. And that's Judge Coomer's fault that it was blurry. Um, he didn't think through the future conflicts presented by being a borrower and designated as executor. We admit that. Um, he used a mixed personal and campaign use credit card for his legislative campaign, and that contributed to accounting errors. That was his mistake to do that. He should not have made transfers to his business without clear records of what campaign expenses the business had incurred. That's the law firm transfers we're talking about. And make no mistake, I, I want to be clear here. While he, had, while he was talking about what his reasons were when they happened, he was not saying that's the right thing to do. It, it just wasn't the right thing to do. Campaign finance laws, Mr. Cathy has uses the word squishy and I can't think of a better word for it. My girlfriend told me not to say that word because she didn't like it, but um, it's true, they are. And maybe that's by design um, because politicians drafted them to regulate themselves. Um, so, but these are non-criminal private conduct errors with no intent to harm anybody and no actual harm to anybody. Mr. Coomer, Judge Coomer has an unblemished record, distinguished military and public career, and he corrected his errors and will not repeat them. So the Philhart wills. Um, Mr. Philhart, this has to be looked at in context. Um, a year before this the first will where Judge Coomer was a beneficiary, Mr. Philhart was filling out account beneficiary designations where most of his assets were that go outside of probate, designating Judge Coomer as his friend, as the beneficiary. I asked Mr. Philhart, it's in page 1538 of this transcript, about the payable on death forms. And he said that he filled those out on his own. And that was pay on death Christian Coomer. And that was a year before any, any will that designated Judge Coomer as a beneficiary. Mr. Boring suggests that Judge Coomer just made himself executor and trustee. Judge Coomer takes responsibility for drafting the paperwork. He shouldn't have drafted that paperwork. He should have sent him to another lawyer if that's the way Mr. Philhart wanted to do things. But he did not solicit a gift from his client. He didn't ask for it. Mr. Philhart wanted him to serve because he trusted him as his friend. 
I asked Mr. Philhart in the transcript of this case, whether he had any doubt that the wills drafted by Christian Coomer reflected his wishes. He said, quote, no, I didn't doubt it a bit. Mr. Philhart, and again, it's not to justify violating a bar rule, but it's to put it in its proper context and to take it out of the context that they're trying to put it in of saying he did this, that Judge Coomer did this on purpose and he did it to try to take money. Mr. Philhart had this same beneficiary for convenience arrangement where a beneficiary would be designated in his will and then distribute per a handwritten list three years before Judge Coomer. I asked Mr. Philhart whether Ms. Bragg in that will was a conduit for distribution to other people. He said that was right, yes. Now, I will confess, Judge Bryson didn't know that that was the way the will was supposed to go back in 2015. That was his testimony. But Mr. Philhart admitted that's what it was for. And the reason he did that is so that he didn't have to keep executing codicils at a cost for attorneys to amend his will. Um, so on the scorecard here, whether the wills conform to Mr. Philhart's wishes, Mr. Philhart said yes, Judge Coomer said yes. Mr. Boring, which is not evidence, claims undue influence. And then there's an unverified complaint by Wright Gammon and then investigator Alford didn't ask, so he didn't have an opinion. And Donald Lundberg didn't read deposition, so he didn't have an opinion on it. As to the loans, um, we talked about this already. And he had this, Mr. Philhart had this thought that he would save money um, and not have to use his pension and social security, and he would just never touch it. And he also said he thought he would make more interest doing it that way than putting it in the bank because the banks weren't paying anything. The eight-year loan term in the September 2018 loan was part of his financial strategy to get a payment when his Teamsters pension was expected to go broke. And at that point, he said, I'm a retired Teamster, and the, and the loan was supposed to be due on that day when it was expected to go broke. Um, the Philhart claims involve suspicious emails with him saying untrue things, claims of depression causing him to enter into transactions a year earlier, saying not to call, continuing to cash loan payments the entire time every month. Mr. Gammon claimed he was hesitant to send the letter to a sitting judge, but he filed suit against the sitting judge for fraud claims that were untrue. And he gave public comments to newspapers about a sitting judge about fraud claims that were untrue. <clears throat> And he claimed he had to file suit for a call that did not happen. And we went and subpoenaed the Court of Appeals phone records and that call did not happen. Um, the telephone call is not important to us because it didn't happen, but the director claims in count seven, this call was somehow improper conduct. Um, the director claims that Judge Coomer acted improperly by asking for a certification. That Mr. Philhart was of sound mind. Now, regardless of what Mr. Coomer put in an email, Mr. Philhart's the one who put in an email that it was a mistake to loan you money in the first place. I was depressed and making a lot of mistakes. Had I been in my right mind, I would have said no to loaning you any money at all. If there's a rule against this, then Mr. Kingman and I are guilty of it too, because as part of the settlement agreement with Mr. Philhart, we require that Wright Gammon execute something or somebody execute something saying that Mr. Philhart appeared to be a sound mind at the time of executing the agreement. Mr. Philhart stated that if Mr. Coomer paid the loans early, it will all be done. And that is out of order, but he started requesting his guardianship case file in May, 2019. There's a bar rule on this that we're supposed to turn over papers or property to which the client is entitled. And it doesn't specify a time frame. We should have provided it earlier than June, 2020. So this is the slide that I meant to show. Um, Mr. Philhart was saying, just pay it all and it will all be done. We're not saying that's an excuse. We're, we're not saying that's the right reason or the right thing to do is not give him his file exactly when he asked for it, no matter who was asking. But there were some conflicting statements that made this a little confusing as to what Mr. Philhart really wanted. He never said, I don't want my file. He said, I want my papers. He may not have said, I want my papers every time he also said, I want my money. Or is there a point where you contend Mr. Philhart said, forget about the file. I just want the money. He didn't say those words, but he said, 
I have everything about you on my computer ready to go to send to the bar or to send to a lawyer. So I have all the emails. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Case file. We, we should have given him his 2016 case file when he requested in 2019, not running away from that. Um, as to this bill issue, Mr. Boring claims that we should have provided bills. Um, Rule 1.5 only requires written bills for contingency cases, and they had a novation where they agreed to a flat fee. Um, while there have been aspersions cast on this fee, no one testified the fee was unreasonable in light of the results obtained or the work done. Um, as to the statement, and I'm just going through the issues Mr. Boring says were wrong with how the Philhart claims were handled. Um, there's a statement by Judge Coomer, I didn't tell you to sell your stocks, and I don't know anything about that, that, that Mr. Boring claims was a misrepresentation. Judge Coomer was responding to a false claim that he told Mr. Philhart to sell stocks. That was Mr. Philhart's claim, and even Mr. Philhart agreed that was false. Um, I'm going to shift to try to make time for Mr. Cathy here to campaign finance. Um, any violation of campaign finance laws, even if intentional, are at most a misdemeanor, and that is not a crime involving moral turpitude. And campaign finance as a legislator, compliance as a legislator, is not a required qualification for judgeship on the Court of Appeals. And we contend those issues do not prejudice the administration of justice. There was an audit instigated here by Mr. Boring. Um, he claimed yesterday that that wasn't them, but investigator Alford at page 1231 said that they're the ones, the JQC is the one who notified the ethics commission when they got bank records about the legislative campaign issues. Judge Coomer resolved the proceeding, paid all they agreed he would pay, didn't commit any crimes, and they found that his court of appeals reporting was squeaky clean. Those were the words of Robert Lane. We talked about these law firm transfers. The logic behind these was flawed. We agree. They were they were reversed in mitigation. They were reversed shortly after they were made. He didn't just he didn't steal money at all. Um, the transfers occurred while he was a legislator. He resolved the issues. He's not made such transfers since, and he pledges not to make them in the future. Mr. We talk, can we yes. can we agree? I'm not in any way attributing language like stealing, but can we agree that? until the audits were done after these investigations started, those audits did reveal that money was owed to the campaigns and that money would have never been repaid back or money, I know he made a payment to ABLF. Money would not have been paid back, not but for these audits that were done years later, correct? I think, yeah, I think we're talking about about $2,450 and it wasn't Judge Coomer on purpose in his head knowing that he owed money to the campaign, but they did find that he owed some money back to the campaign. Right, so there was a benefit to him personally that would have never been discovered, but for these investigations. Um, he, he, used, he used campaign funds for personal expenditures, and that would not have been discovered, but for these investigations. We, we've admitted that, yeah, we, that, that's true. I, okay. I agree with that. Um, his camp, for, now, most of these issues came up on the trips because of a mixed use card. There was an auto payment, as we know, and then he tried to pay personal expenses as they arose. Um, he fell approximately $2,000 short for the Hawaii trip. Um, Mr. Lane agreed with this being a fair summary, paid some of it personally, paid some of it with campaign expenses, paid some back when a trip blew up as far as business purposes and should have paid back more. Um, Pat Salem <coughs> testified that their accounting expert testified that there was about $100,000 in three months put on that card, 90,000 paid with campaign funds. That leaves about $10,000, 9,000 and something paid with personal funds. So there was some effort to kind of balance this out. It did fall short, we agree. He resolved the issue with the CFC. He hasn't missed the count it since and pledges to use a better system and to report better. As to this extension of credit, um, he didn't intentionally violate campaign finance laws. It's not even clear whether that was a violation. Campaign Finance Commission withdrew this charge because the statute's not clear. Statute lists something you're supposed to report. The report doesn't have a line to list it. Could it have been reported better? Sure. Um, Judge Coomer pledges to do it differently next time. He would just actually, if he needs to make a loan to his campaign, he'll make a loan to his campaign and not do an extension of credit. Um, the JNC application, there was an application 
um, noting a real estate holding company had been liquidated after its real estate holdings were in fact liquidated. Um, this is the statement on there in question 19, a real estate holding company which has been liquidated. He used the word, word liquidated to mean converted to cash, which is an accepted meaning. And it's number three on this online dictionary to convert assets into cash. What does the paper dictionary say? Oh, I don't know. Mr. Cathy would have to comment on that. Um, Mr. Boring used this word liquidate, by the way, in opening statement, the exact same way that Judge Coomer used it on the application. He was talking about Mr. Philhart liquidating investments. That's converting it to cash. That's on page 34 of the transcript. The mortgage application, we talked about that yesterday. I think I wanna skip so I can leave more time for Mr. Cathy. We talked about the biggest thing is exhibit 87, no assets listed. He got the loan locked at the time of that application being submitted with no assets listed. Let me just skip through a little bit. All right. And we talked about this yesterday as well. There's a there's no way that Judge Coomer was trying to inflate his assets with a hundred and one dollar and seventy four cent law firm account. Obviously, those accounts were there because of some other process, not because he put them there, not because he was intending to be deceitful. And he also uploaded his um, statements for uh, the uh, United Community Bank campaign that had it listed as campaign Christian Coomer treasurer. Um, and it had his proper bank location. Skip a little bit and get us to this um, 18 USC 1001 cited by the director in the formal charges requires materiality for misrepresentations. First off, there weren't misrepresentations in this application, but if they were to violate this statute, it has to be falsification of a material fact, materially false, materially false. So the weight of the evidence, no fraud, Judge Coomer, the documents, Shane Senior, Director Boring, which is not evidence, says it was fraud, witnesses with no opinion, they're fraud investigator. Um, Mr. Cathy is going to talk more about character than I am, and I'm going to leave that on his plate, but I want to talk about one thing before I leave you folks. Um, continuing conduct on the bench, and that's a big point of Mr. Boring's, and I, I want to talk about what Judge Coomer's continuing conduct on the bench has been. He paid Mr. Philhart all monthly payments as agreed on time. He paid back all of Mr. Philhart's loan in full with interest earlier than agreed. He negotiated a fair resolution with Mr. Philhart. He cooperated with and negotiated a resolution with the Campaign Finance Commission. He paid the Campaign Finance Commission as agreed plus money to charity. He spoke at a local and state bar functions. He gave to charity. He volunteered time for mock trial com competitions. He served in the United States Air Force and he has been an advocate for the judiciary with members of the General Assembly. And he's also mentored young adults who do not have fathers through his church. The biggest thing, and I'm leaving this quote up, but the biggest thing that came out in this trial was an unexpected kind of drive-by story from Judge Bryson. When he was a college student, when no one was looking, Judge Bryson went and saw Judge Coomer when he was a lawyer and Judge Coomer spent the time with him, mentored him and was kind and generous with his time. Um, that was their witness. And I'll bet you they didn't know he was gonna say that um, because that's not what this investigation's been interested in. Um, when Mr. Philhart made false claims that are embarrassing, that was reason for a fair investigation. We contend one was not done. Um, that was not reason to wage a war here. And what Mr. Boring asked for an opening was simply remove Judge Coomer from the bench, not give fair consideration to the evidence and listen to the witnesses and then make an appropriate recommendation. That's all we're doing here. That's all we're asking for. And each one of your voices is important on that, not just in what the recommendation is, but in the findings that you find, because Judge Coomer is an honorable man and he's lived his life that way. And 
it's important to Judge Coomer what your words are that get to the final recommendation. It's important to his wife, Heidi. It's important to his son who had to sit in high school and hear people say, is my dad a fraud? Um, it's important to the people who elected him. It's important to the Air Force. Um, and it's important to me because he's my friend. So thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Cappy. So Mr. Cappy has about 15 minutes. I trust he will be just addressing the, what should we do? Um, yes. Because you were very effectively and thoroughly covered what may have been shown or not shown, but I hope we get a little bit of what ought we to do. Your Honor, I, that's what my goal is. And I wanna preface my goal by saying this, I don't stand here suggesting that no sanction should be issued against Judge Cooper. I am standing here and beseeching with any powers that I have with this panel to consider with all the panoply of sanctions available and this matrix of, ev matrix of evidence, something that would be in order for us to accomplish what we all want to accomplish. The role of the JQC, as, as Mr. Boring always skillfully presents, is that we lawyers and we society want a clean bench. We, we want honorable people honorable men and women that we can trust with resolving our conflicts. I've known Christian Coomer all these years and my career has bumped up against him all this time. And I, I have arrived at a decision about his ability and what he's morally capable of doing and being. And I do not want to testify, you'll keep me from doing it anyway, but it, it really is important uh, to know the man. Now, I think whether we're disciplining, disciplining our children, whether we're disciplining defendants of, before you in court, before you're sanctioning anybody, we need to keep two things in mind. We have to discriminate and decide between people who are disappointing us and frustrating us and maybe even making us mad. We have to distinguish them between them and the ones who are unfit and are dangerous. Now the unfitness and the dangerous in our setting is the judge who we can't trust to go on the bench and we can't trust to hear two sides and make a decision. We have, we have, a very long sample size of what that is with Christian Cooper. He's been on the bench. He's made those decisions. The decision here that you're going to have, and this is unprecedented. We, we've never had an appellate judge come before the panel. In, in my, if it did, it was handled at the IP level where nobody ever knew it. And uh, that might've been a convenient place to do this. I don't think we've ever had a judge come with campaign finance problems. As I said, colloquy with the court somewhere in there, I was on that campaign finance committee for seven years. Uh, and uh, the rules are part of the dismal science down there of going through and being county and coming up with things. It has been evolving. It was the ethics panel, then it was the Georgia government transparency and campaign finance committee initials that were too long for me to remember. So I still called it the ethics panel. But I remember when I went, I turned to one of my friends and I said, this reminds me of something happened to me when I was a young lawyer. And uh, he said, what's that? I said, I had a client that got burned up with a gas explosion. And I talked to other lawyer and he said, oh, you've got a case. I said, what do you mean you haven't even heard about it? He said, nobody could comply with the national gas code, so you've got a case. It was almost <laughs> like that at the campaign finance committee. And the way the committee worked is you heard uh, uh, Robert testify that uh, they did about 10% random. We, we check everybody, but we really can't. And you had three or four ways that people would come before you, whether they were a councilman and a IRA, or a court of appeals judge, they would do one of those random audits and find things they scratched their head about. Many of them were their opposition people who ran against them would say, you better check on this person. She spent money going to the hairdresser instead of uh, whatever. 
And some of them are complaints like this that come. Maybe some of them newspaper. We read things in the newspaper. So we, we ask you to judge in this man's overall character. Uh, I interviewed him when he came through the JNC. And I was on that for eight years. And when he came through the JNC, as you all know, we had special interest groups talk about that judge. The women lawyers, the state bar, the local bar. And Judge Coomer was uniformly praised by everybody. In earlier times, I had, because of my interest in the judicial, uh, the uh, civil justice system, had some interface with the legislature. I went down to the legislature. He was revered by people down there. They respected him. I, I, a friend of mine who was a lobbyist said, this is the guy you need to talk to, and sent me to Christian Coomer. Now, uh, we just don't have any record whether, where this man committed this. I've wondered whether or not when we got this complaint about Chris and it was about money, whether the, the uh, campaign finance committee or the G JQC or somebody said, look at this, he's stealing 150 grand from his client. I'll bet if we get in his books and get his bank accounts, we're just going to find all kinds of stuff. And they went and they did the GBI and they did the secret subpoena and they got it all these bank records and the campaign finance committee who's good at that and got personnel to look through all of it came up and they had what they had in my experience down there it was handled about like all of them are yeah you got to pay back you got to pay money and they got there they looked at the mortgage fraud well the bankers say he didn't commit fraud so I hate to use that old frat hackneyed phrase, but they got there and there was no there there. We had the little there there, which was handled by the campaign finance committee. And that's about the way it ought to end. That's the way all of them ended. We get, you're gonna pay a fine, you're gonna pay the money back. Uh, we just read in 2022 in the newspaper, where a 13 year campaign finance committee investigation, 13 years was cleared where the money was used for fancy cars, trips, athletic clubs that ended with no finding by the campaign finance committee. And what the candidate did, he's waived his, he put $198,000 was what the money we're talking about. But fancy cars, athletic clubs, paying your house off, as opposed to this horrible trip to the Holy Land where we're gonna look at, take my minister wife to the Holy Land with my children. We're gonna look at the Coca-Cola plant, pretty important thing when you're uh, a legislature in the state of Georgia, that's a pretty important company. And we didn't ignore it, we just didn't pay quite enough. And that's, 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 what, that's what this, I heard, what, the story was about. So when we concluded with that, we, that should have been over, not part of this deal that we're having to go through now. Uh, so I ask you, uh, in the overall look at this history, with this one-off thing we have, Mr. F we look, I'm disappointed in Chris Cook. I'm frustrated with him. I'm mad at him. You shouldn't have done that. But that doesn't end his career. Imagine, imagine this ending this man's career when you look at the balance of the rest of it. So I come back to the way we discipline. Are we just mad at him and disappointed? Or is he evil, corrupt, unfit to serve and dangerous to our society? He is not that. We can't look at what he's been on the bench and make that conclusion. There is no way we can make that conclusion. Now, uh, I did come up with clear and convincing because when we try cases and we require clear and convincing and we try them, I've just always said, well, it's somewhere between reasonable doubt and a preponderance. And so I said, well, if, reason, if preponderance is 51 and reasonable doubt is 95, it must be lay in there somewhere around 70. 
I did something. I put my old black law dictionary off the shelf and you see the definition. I came to the <coughs> conclusion. It's not on that 45 degree angle between those. It's much closer to reasonable doubt. It really is. But if you look at the definition, now, no courts here define it. They just say it's more than this and less than that. But I think, is it clear and convincing to you that this man committed such act of this? I live in a small town. I practice in a small town where people walk in off the street and they talk to you and they say things to you. You ask when, uh, when his role as lawyer stopped and started, I'll give you the answer. 100% of the time he was his friend. When he was called upon to do a legal service for him, he was his client. I have lawyer uh, people in my community tell me, Dennis is my lawyer. I hadn't seen him in 10 years, but I'm his lawyer. And what that means, if I want a lawyer, he's the guy I'll go to. That's what it means. So the, the blur lines never blur with your friendship. They're always there. The friendship's always there. It interfaces often with your commitment to your client. Now, what indication do we have Five minutes. Five minutes. I think I don't need that much. Can I get an extra 30, like a soccer game? Can I go get 30 seconds? So I'm drinking. Three times. I got to finish big because one of the most impressive prosecutors in the state of Georgia is going to come next. And we now know he's under the influence of, of performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. <laughs> He's had his day quill. We'll put an asterisk <laughs> next to his clothing. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, the, uh, Mark alluded to the importance of this panel. Uh, it's seductive to say, well, you know, the Supreme Court's going to do what they want to do. That's not true. Uh, they are going to do what they want to do. That is true. And they, uh, if you follow lawyer discipline and judicial discipline, they can go either way. They can say, this is too harsh, this is too light. I'm gonna to confirm what you give, but you're giving recommendations. The reason it's, the reason it's important is this. The vi rule violations we have, the judge shall respect and comply with the law. Well, that's pretty broad, isn't it? And then finally, he's got to act to promote public confidence and independence of the judiciary. Now you can <coughs> drive one of the biggest uh, class aircraft carriers through those things. That's pretty big, broad things. So what your job is, this panel's job is to, as, as a fact finder, as a judgment of credibility, sit here and say, what, what is important here? What do we take from the evidence? And this matrix I talk about, we got a lawyer, not a judge, and we got a system to deal with those lawyers. We don't have JQC hearings very often uh, about something that's concurrent with the, uh, the state bar. There's an there's a investigation going on now by the state bar about whether or not the state bar rules are violated. That's concurrent jurisdiction. We certainly don't expect our JQC to sit here and do the same job that a statutory committed campaign finance committee ought to do. So let's, let's let those two fact finders and decision makers do, which are more equipped to make these decisions than y'all are. They're more equipped. They got more staff than the JQC. They got people dedicated to unique things rather than the JQC. And that's what they're designed for. And, and those two things are going on. It did go on. We thought campaign finance was over. So we have those, but you, have to come and get this, which, which, first, which witness do I believe? Which witness do I believe? Uh, should we treat off the bench prejudicial conduct? How should we treat it? I suggest that you should treat it. When I was on the, uh, once again, that's me. When I was on the uh, investigative panel of the state disciplinary board, this is a small town lawyer who had a, a confrontation argument with his client. He meets all the mitigation that we would consider in that category. He made restitution. He admitted it. He was remorse. He cooperated fully. That is not conduct that would result in disbarment as a lawyer. Most of the violations don't even carry 
disbarment as a maximum penalty of, of these alleged in, in the, maybe all of them don't carry it. So if it doesn't carry disbarment, as a lawyer, it shouldn't carry lose your role as a judge. It just shouldn't. Now, the campaign finance committee allegations, they've been beat to death, y'all have heard of them. So y'all have got to decide. How many minutes, Judge? Less than one. Somewhere in the spectrum of sanctions for a judge, there is room for an late Leiden panel to say, this is a good man, historically sound, judicially perfect. He's not had one mark against him. Somewhere in this scope of graduated punishment, we must recognize that this is not worthy of the death penalty. And uh, I believe that our system and judges and people who take a deep look into this will say, Christian Coomer, do what's the only thing he can do, a reputation built on 48 years, given to his church, doing everything possible. His goodness befriending a man who desperately needed a friend, and he did. He had none. And uh, Christian Coomer did more for that man by being his friend than you could imagine. And uh, their relationship was, was strange. But this man needs to be made whole again, if possible. We've heard it 48 years, you can build a reputation and in a little bit you lose it. And the only way that he can get a semblance back of the reputation and the dream he had and what he loved about this. And, and I, I meant to say somewhere yesterday when we started, we're talking about the Court of Appeals, which has suffered a tremendous loss this last week with the loss of Clyde Reese, one of the nicest, kindest judges that we've ever had in the state. And we should all remember him. And uh, he was a friend of Chris Coomer's and Chris Coomer, the only way let him come back to the bench. Let him show he's a man of character. Let him demonstrate again his goodness for the system of Georgia and the Court of Appeals. Your Honor, it's been a pleasure being with you these hearings, and this may not see you again in this setting. So you take care. Thank you. Mr. Boring, we're going to press on if that's all right, unless you need a break or Ms. Johnson needs a break. Jeez, I, I think that is an effective tactic from the court to move me along. <laughs> All right. Just have a second. Are you plugging into the lectern? I, I am. I'm going to plug into the lectern. Yes, Judge. Members of the hearing panel, when the public sees a judge ignore legal principles, legal rules that apply to them in their profession, and fail to follow the law themselves, it creates distrust of all judges and the judicial office. I want one thing to be clear. Um, after some of the, the, uh, the closing argument of Mr. Coomer's counsel. This case didn't start with Mr. Phil Hart. This case started with Judge Coomer and his actions. We've spent a lot of time victim blaming in this case, blaming everybody else for what Mr. Coomer did. You know, Mr. Phil Hart wanted to do this. Mr. Phil Hart wanted to do that. Oh, the ethics commission, this and that. Let it be clear, we are here because of Judge Coomer and his actions. Um, I know <clears throat> it's been a while since we were here for the first week of it. And I know you, you all have heard a lot of testimony, been presented a ton of evidence in this case. Um, and I think this being a lot different than a jury setting um, with three professionals, uh, you all have obviously paid close attention, asked very pointed questions, oftentimes better questions than I thought of myself. Um, to really get to the heart of the matter. 
So I don't want to beat the proverbial dead horse over and over again. Um, I do want to go over, though, um, the, the rule violations in this case and go back over with you all, kind of since we've been away from it a little bit, the actual charges in the amended formal charges and how they apply to the facts that came out before you uh, in this courtroom. Uh, just kind of starting with uh, the rules that are uh, at play here. Uh, within this amended formal charge, we had three different violations. Uh, rule 1.2A, Rule 1.1, and Rule 4.2B. Now, Rule 1.2A, uh, judges shall at, act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the jury judiciary. And this extends to both the professional and personal conduct of the judge. And one thing I just wanted to hit on uh, regarding this as far as commentary and how the appearance of impropriety applies in 1.2a and in this canon specifically, um, it's important that even though Judge Coomer and this relationship with Mr. Philhart and the relationship with camp campaign finance with him finally after the investigated investigation started paying the funds back, it's the appearance of impropriety that really impacts the reputation of the judiciary, not only from Judge Coomer's office, but for the judiciary as a whole. And the definition of appearance of impropriety, whether the conduct would create in reasonable minds a perception that the judge's ability to carry out judicial responsibilities with integrity, impartiality, and competence is impaired. That, and that definition is in the rules. I believe it is in the commentary, or yes. Not in a dictionary. No, it is not. It is it's actually applied in, in Georgia law as applied to the Code of Judicial Conduct. Um, and the key in here is the integrity. Um, and that's what we have cited in our rules, that issue of integrity. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as integrity is, is defined in the rules. Um, rule 1.1 is, I mean, that's just pretty cut and dry. It, judges shall respect and comply with the law. What does the rules, uh, how do they define it? Uh, it's court rules as well as statutes, constitutional provisions, decisional law, including the Code of Judicial Conduct and advisory opinions of the JQC. So any of the statutes that we have cited in the formal charges, uh, rules of the court, professional rules of conduct, the code of judicial conduct, those all fall under 1.1. And 4.2b, this is only in regard to the last two counts of the amended formal charges. Uh, judicial candidates, including incumbent judges, shall not use or permit the use of campaign contributions for the private benefit of themselves and members of their families. That is applied and charged solely as to the uh, use of campaign funds on the Hawaii trip, as that was the only uh, as far as the trip that he went on when he was a judicial candidate and having used those personal funds. Uh, just as a timeline of Judge Coomer's professional status, um, he was an attorney and a state rep for years. Uh, he was an attorney from 99 through March 28, 2018. Um, he was a state rep starting in 2011. So attorney for years, state rep starting in 2011. Um, in March 29th, on that day, 2018, he became a judicial candidate uh, by applying for a code of, uh, court of appeals vacancy. Um, and then he withdrew his candidacy in late April of 2018. Uh, again, he became a judicial candidate August 30th, 2018 um, by applying for the Supreme Court vacancy. On September 14th, he was appointed to the court of appeals. That was announced. And then he was actually sworn in on October 31st, 2018. So <clears throat> how I've broken it down as far as going through the different counts and the amended formal charges, is discussing it via topic and via subject matter. Um, first of all, um, I'm gonna talk about the drafting of the wills and that irrevocable living trust, uh, having Coomer as the beneficiary. Um, he drafted wills on May 17th, uh, on May of 2017, uh, at that time as an attorney and state rep. This one, having himself as an executor and a trustee, that will is actually not charged in the amended formal charge. Um, he was at that time a beneficiary of other pay, pay on death accounts and that type of thing. Um, <clears throat> May 23rd, as far as the timeline of the mill, wills, uh, 2018, uh, he was an attorney and state rep, and this will continue to be in place after he became a judicial candidate. Uh, and then on September 19th, 2018, after he had the appointment had been announced, after he had applied on August 30th, um, he entered into this third will 
on September 19th, 2018. So he was absolutely a judicial candidate on that day. And this will continue to be in place uh, into the time that he was actually a judge. Uh, these violations are per se violations of Rule 1.8C. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, this continuing violations from the time he is an attorney, state rep, through judicial appointment, and even after he became a Court of Appeals judge. Um, it was drafted such that he could control uh, how much he and his family would receive from the estate. Now, this is where we get to that appearance of impropriety issue. Did he ever act upon it? Did Mr. Mr. Philhart, thank goodness, is still alive today, even though he suffered through uh, lung cancer surgery during the midst of these proceedings um, and basically had to come up here three years after or three weeks after having gone through that surgery, which I think speaks volumes. While he didn't actually act on it, never had the opportunity. Here's the thing. The way he drafted that was A, in violation of a bar rule and B, created that impression and created that appearance. And then when he was becoming a judge and had already been appointed, he drafted it, making his wife the executor and trustee. Uh, leaving himself as the beneficiary. <clears throat> Specifically with accounts, uh, counts one through three uh, are the drafting of the wills pursuant or vis-a-vis -vis the violation being rule 1.2a. Um, integrity, the definition under 1.2a means probity, fairness, honesty, uprightness, and soundness of character. Judge Coomer did not discuss with Mr. Philhart the inherent conflict in being executor, trustee, and beneficiary of these wills, especially when you take into consideration the amount and the hundreds of thousands of dollars of loans that he had taken out. Um, did not discuss that at all. Um, he didn't tell uh, Mr. Philhart that he was not allowed to do so per 1.8c. And I think as, as uh, Judge Lopez pointed out, um, that rule's in the same rule. It's like two sentences below 1.8 that he went to the extent of looking up when dealing with going into transactions and benefiting someone uh, that you're representing or have represented. Um, counts 15 through 17 also deal with the drafting of the wills, and that is under the violation of Rule 1.1, which for our purposes, um, he violated the Bar Rule 1.8c, thus he violated the law and the Code of Judicial Conduct. Going into the loans, uh, just as a timeline and discussing what the facts are with the, the dates of the, uh, the, the actual loans, uh, the first loan he took out was December 6, 2017. This was the $80,000 loan when he was an attorney and a state representative. Uh, then after paying it off, um, after selling the house that he had at CAC, and if I forget to mention it, that's why that was put in the actual amended formal charges and mentioned, because um, he had $20,000 in CAC at the time he applied and was making payments to Mr. Phil Hart on this new $159,000 loan uh, that he took out on March 8, 2000, 2018. And then on September 8, 2018, he took out a $130,000 loan uh, while a judicial candidate. And this loan, he continued in and being active into the time that he was actually still a judge on the Court of Appeals, which he is today. Now, the violations of this um, uh, particular, these acts, um, we've got factually, if you're going to, to the issue, if you're actually taking out a loan from a client or somebody that you've represented, it doesn't matter if you get a conflict waiver. It still has to be fair and reasonable. Nobody can interpret these loans as fair and reasonable. Um, they were not secured. And I'll talk about it later, this argument that, well, he did it with other people. Judge Coomer's got a different, uh, a different role here, a different responsibility as his attorney. It's not the bob on the street and ended in a different business deal. There is a difference in the relationship of the trust between a client and their attorney. And you all heard how Mr. Phil Hart trusted Judge Coomer and how he thought that man walked on water and basically worked miracles for him with that guardianship. Um, list Mr. Philhart's property ostensibly as collateral on multiple loans. Uh, the length of the loans were completely unreasonable given Mr. Philhart's age, a 20 year loan, which was the December one, and a 30 year loan exceeding his, his likely life expectancy. Um, it doesn't matter if a client agrees to this type of thing in a loan, it is a violation because it's not fair and reasonable. And the rate on the March 18th loan was well below what the average interest rate was. 
And the September 18, 2018 loan was 100% not reasonable. He didn't even have to make payments. He being Mr. Coomer at the time, Mr. Coomer, actually at Judge Coomer is part of it, um, until Mr. Philhart would have been 84 years old in 2026 with a balloon payment. And again, <clears throat> we talked about informed consent. Additionally, uh, any type of consent, even if they get consent. First, not fair and reasonable, regardless of consent. Two, it has to be informed consent. And this was established that it was not informed consent just through the cross-examination of Judge Coomer. He didn't convey adequate information and explanation about the risks um, or any reasonable alter available alternatives to the proposal. Um, He admitted in no way did he explain to him the legalities and the implications of having these loans made to CAC Holdings rather than personally uh, guaranteed to Judge Coomer. He didn't go through the interest rates and the fact that it was lower. Um, he didn't go through several things that I think the cross-examination and the transcripts will reflect that um, would have been more of an informed consent. All right, the counts in the amended formal charges relevant to the loans <clears throat> counts four through six discuss the violations uh, via rule 1.2a of the Code of Judicial Conduct. Um, again, Judge Coomer was the attorney, was an attorney representing him as we heard through the testimony and you'll see in the invoices throughout the time until he became a judge. He's the attorney who drafted this Mr. Philhart testified that he relied on his legal expertise in drafting this. He's the lawyer. And he told Mr. Philhart that he'd pay him back in a year. And the emails, when you look through the emails, I know Judge Coomer denies doing that, but there are emails in there from Mr. Philhart. You said you would pay me back in a year. Not once does Judge Coomer respond and say, well, that's not true. <clears throat> they were unsecured. Um, and to CAC, not personally guaranteed. They were not fair and reasonable. And you look at this perception, the appearance of impropriety. Judge Coomer gave Mr. Philhart advice on, or helped him draft an email about the tax implications of liquidating a stock. So Mr. Philhart said, yeah, he knew. We had discussed, it. I'm selling my stocks to make him a loan. He didn't have the money on him at the time. He'd already basically given him all his cash that he had liquid and available. And we'll talk about this whole liquid uh, situation in a second and what I actually said in the opening statement. Um, he took money from Mr. Philhart after Mr. Philhart had sold his stocks, which were an investment. And what did he do with it? He invested it himself. Counts 18 through 20. <clears throat> Again, this is the, for the same facts. Uh, involved uh, a rule 1.1 violation for violating the Georgia Rules of Professional Conduct 1.8a, entering into a business transaction with a client, not fair and reasonable. And I think this one, the initial comment in the ABA rules regarding transactions with your client under rule 1.a, I think this speaks volumes. It kind of explains like what the problem is with this. A lawyer's legal skill and training together with the relationship of trust and confidence between a lawyer and client, create the possibility of overreaching when the lawyer participates in a business, property, or financial transaction with a client. For example, a loan or sales transaction or a lawyer investment on behalf of a client. Doesn't that sound familiar to what we've had happen in this courtroom and what happened with Mr. Philhart and Mr. Coomer? Absolutely. All right. Turning to uh, conduct after uh, Mr. Philhart requested repayment of the loans. Count seven charges uh, the uh, charges Judge Coomer with violating Rule 1.2a um, for his conduct after uh, Mr. Philhart requested repayment of the loans. And it listed as, first of all, the failure to return records. I don't think we've got any question here uh, about the, the violation by failing to return his records. Um, he asked repeatedly. He asked repeatedly for billing information. He asked repeatedly to get his, his uh, uh, files back. Uh, misrepresentations and emails about prior knowledge of 
and involvement in using Phil Hart's investment accounts to fund the September 2018 loan and tax issues. First of all, we got Mr. Phil Hart's testimony about that and the fact that they did discuss he was going to be liquidating these stocks. But more importantly, I think Mr. Lefko left out the last part of that email, and you'll have it with you, where he says he doesn't know anything about the tax issues either. It's in the email. It's in the email where he says, I don't know anything about you, you know, uh, you know, selling your stocks, which was not true. Um, because Mr. Phil Hart has no motivation to lie about that in an email. Um, two, <clears throat> um, he, he discussed specifically tax issues with the sale of the stocks. And we've got the emails where he does it. Um, then he demanded that Mr. Phil Hart provide documentation of mental status before discussing uh, the repayment and related issues. And this was done not on that March 5th email that was put on the screen before you. This was Mr. Coomer's first response to the email from Mr. Philhart on February 22nd, 2018, where he just immediately pops up. Well, you told me you, you don't want to live anymore and that you're having you know, memory issues and all that immediately in response to a client saying, I want to be paid back. <clears throat> and then the email and call to Mr. Gammon. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but we have that, and that is in the amended formal charge that there was a phone call and there was an email. I don't think we have any doubt that that actually happened. Was there a second call? It doesn't look like it from the phone records, but Mr. Gammon told you, why does this stick out in your mind? Because I never had anybody react like that or have a phone call in that way like he had with Judge Coomer. All right. Um, also, uh, conduct after uh, Mr. Phil Hart requested repayment of the loans counts 21 through 22. These are the same factors uh, under Code of Judicial Conduct 1.1 for specific violations of the Georgia Rules of Professional Conduct, specifically as related to re not returning documents. Um, rule 1.4 A4, failing and refusing to promptly comply with reasonable requests for information. These are the itemized bill and invoices for a fee. Uh, file in the record in Coomer's possession. Why? Why did he not provide these? What is the motive for that? Because he knows that didn't add up. It looks really bad when you look at these billing invoices. And I charged this elderly man $80,000 for a guardianship and his invoices show he only earned between 45 and 50,000. Also rule 1.16 D, failing and refusing to surrender documents to which a client was entitled. <clears throat> Just the, the dates on these to go over real quick. Um, the dates of the requests that were made, March 5th, 2019, April 16th, 2019. Then you've got the, doc, the letter from Dr. Moon. Yes, I got a letter from the doctor saying, you know, he's not crazy right now. Um, May 24th, again, requested return, no response. May 29th, no response. August 2019, no response. Continuing until the JQC meets with him in June of 2020. Again, a conduct after Phil Hart requested repayment of loans. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is not the right, that's not the right count that's up there. Um, that is going to be rule, I think that's just count 23 for that one. But it is one that cites rule 8.4A4. And it talks about the continuing pattern of conduct in Judge Coomer dealing professionally with uh, Mr. Coomer, Mr. Phil Hart and Mr. Coomer. First, yes, there was a pattern of deceit, dishonesty, and misrepresentation. And Mr. Lundberg talked about one of those. As you know, he, he only had a certain amount of information about what had happened between the two of them. And then we've talked about a lot more of that um, that Mr. Lundberg did not have uh, in his possession. Um, dishonesty and deceit can be acts of commission and omission, failing to explain, failing to tell people the implications of their behavior. The manner in which he drafted the notes so that the loans were not fair and reasonable. The involvement of CAC in these loans, as opposed to it being a fair and reason, or excuse me, a, a personal guarantee or a personal loan. The sale of stocks and claims that he didn't know anything about the taxes or about what Mr. Phil Hart was doing to make the loan and a refusal to provide records that he knew would make him look bad. 
Okay, the mortgage application. This is only one count and it's not a violation set out as he committed the crime of mortgage fraud. Um, I know Mr. Lefko mentioned the federal statute. That was in the factual portion of the amended formal charge because he actually signed a form saying that he knew it would be a federal crime if he actually was untruthful on an application. What the amended formal charge actually says is that it was an act that violated the public's confidence because of a lack of integrity. He signed the application on March 26, 2020, listing campaign account as assets. These were not his personal assets. And look back at the transcript of Shane Senior. He said that no, he never had a conversation with Mr. Coomer about the fact that these were unnecessary at that point and that he would not have known at that point that these were going to be unnecessary with the filing of his application. And then we find out where it started out, you know, the, the discussion, oh, it was all uh, automatically uploaded from his, uh, from the internet bank account. Then Shane Senior realizes, oh wait, he actually uploaded a document. And then we had to shift. We had to shift the explanation. Uh, okay, so the silly excuse. Well, I wanted to just submit and upload a form so Maybe these bankers would have the knowledge of campaign accounts and this word that I'm a treasurer. So then I hope they would assume that they know they can't consider that. That's cockamamie. That's unbelievable. And you as a hearing panel are the judges of credibility in this case. And I believe there are several times throughout this hearing where the testimony has just been, it's just not credible. It's just not credible. This is one of those moments. Um, he did not list the Philhart loans on the application. And again, this isn't, was not included as a violation of the law. It is just other evidence of, you know, the, the actions that show a lack of integrity. He listed the personal debt uh, on that personal financial statement that you've seen from 2000, December of 2019 that he filed um, with an, another business transaction. Uh, where he listed it as a personal debt, even though it was unsecured, the loans to Mr. Philhart. But here, he doesn't. Uh, I know Mr. Lefko talked about the lawsuit and how he had disclosed the lawsuit. Y'all are going to have the emails. Y'all are going to have the records. He checked the box where it said, I'm a party to a lawsuit. And then it also says, okay, send an explanation of what it is. He didn't do that. He didn't respond about the lawsuit until he got emails in April about what was going on with it. And you'll see the emails about his description of it. And then finally, they ask more questions, get a, get a, um, they request the complaints and all the, the, those documents, and then they send some of them. Not the, they didn't include the actual attachment from, from uh, Mr. Lundberg that was on the original complaint, um, which I think is interesting. Okay, campaign finance violations. There were several um, issues regarding his violation of campaign finance law. Uh, first, we have the transfer of funds between the campaign and the law firm. We have the family trip to Hawaii with no legislative event. We have a mixed use trip to Israel for the whole family. And then we have the fictitious loan to the campaign of $50,000. Um, and again, this is one of those evolving like descriptions or excuses for the behavior. You know, well, these are gonna be mistaken transfers. Well, now we know that there's no way these were mistaken transfers. Maybe a couple of them is what their excuse was, but the ones in the actual formal charges, these weren't ones that were just mistaken and needed to be reversed. Judge Coomer admitted he intended to do it, and then he changed his mind. Uh, so there is no argument that under the law, these disclosures or these transfers were required to be disclosed from the campaign to the law firm and the law firm back. <clears throat> okay, talking about the transfer of funds between the campaign and the firm. Count eight uh, deals with that as far as rule 1.2a. It alleges that uh, Judge Coomer failed to disclose the transfer on his CCDR reports, which continued through the time when he was already on the bench. You will see um, the, the transfers that he made, several of them to Kay Smith, um, at the end of October, when he was transitioning to the bench, and then his CCDR reports that he filed were while he was already on the bench after he had taken the bench. Um, also, it's what that it's alleged is a violation for floating the firm account. You've got several of these throughout, and we went over in, in detail yesterday, late afternoon, 
Um, he was floating the firm account. He was floating the firm account. And then you've got payments to Kay Smith right before taking judicial office. Counts 24 through 27 involve Rule 1.1 for violating OCGA 21.534 and 21.533. One statute require, requires the disclosure. Um, the other statute makes it improper to use it for your own personal gain. Keeping your law firm afloat is personal gain. Okay, regarding the family trip to uh, Hawaii, counts nine through 10 uh, are pursuant to rule 1.2a violations for failing to disclose and using campaign funds for personal use. Uh, there, there's no doubt about that. Um, counts 28 through 29, rule 1.1, again, for those same uh, statutes regarding campaign disclosures, and then counts 35 and 36, rule 4.2b, um, as a judicial candidate using campaign funds for personal benefit. And to say, and the excuse that, and th this is another thing that's bringing disrepute to the judiciary with this whole proceeding, uh, with some of the testimony here, to think that it is okay to plan a trip to Hawaii with your family, not just you for a trip to go try to do something legislatively, but with your wife and with your kids, using campaign funds, and then trying to find some tour of a rural hospital in Hawaii, that doesn't pass a smell test. Why is he doing that? He's funding his personal trips with his campaign money, benefiting his family. And even then, he doesn't pay it back. He doesn't pay it back. He pays some of the funds when it gets to the end, he gets back from the trip uh, for some of his kids' flights, but then he's paid for meals, he's paid for his flight, paid for his wife's flight, which are all improper. The mixed trip used to Israel for the whole family, again, uh, and I, I think, yeah, there are absolutely a couple of legislative uh, events there. We heard from Mr. Lane talking about, yes, but you don't take a whole week trip to get to hang out with your family and tour a bottle company here and, and then uh, maybe go to one other event. Um, counts 11 through 12, uh, involve Rule 1.2a, again, failing to disclose uh, these actual um, expenditures and using campaign funds for personal and family use. And I think that's the key here. And it, it, it really speaks volumes to this American Express miscellaneous ex expenses. What kind of public confidence can they, can the public have in Judge Coomer when he has spent tens of thousands of campaign funds and just saying that where the public has a right to know the end recipient of these campaign funds. He didn't disclose it for a reason. Counts 30 through 31, again, rule 1.1 with the specific violations of uh, the campaign finance law statutes. <clears throat> again, in Israel, he did pay back the uh, expenses for the kids for their flights. Um, he obviously knew it was wrong because he ended up paying it back and he didn't pay it back until the next year, which is consistent with the floating of funds between different accounts he had. The fictitious $50,000 loan. If y'all believe this line of credit thing, I've got some swamp land in Florida to sell you. Um, this was an obvious violation. Uh, declaring a loan and then declaring repayment, which I think is key. When you look at these CCDRs, you look at his history of knowing how to make an addendum uh, the language that he actually would have typed out on the repayment, um, it, the, the excuse doesn't make sense. Um, counts 32 through 34, Rule 1.1 violations again. <clears throat> um, these, and you look at the intent. How did this help him? How would this have benefited him by just putting this $50,000 loan, which doesn't exist, uh, again, while I'm thinking about it, some kind of train of thought. Um, he knew he was being, he was, being asked to repay all these loans from Mr. Philhart. He had over $250,000 in outstanding loans to Mr. Philhart at this time. He had $214 in his UBS account. Um, so to say that, oh yeah, yes, I had this money here, there, I could have li liquidated my car, um, liquidated my, you know, sold these things, that doesn't pass the smell test either. Um, this, the, these putting of the $50,000 uh, on this, uh, campaign statement, which I think it's telling because it's leading right up to qualification and whether he's going to have an opponent or not. He almost doubled 
the money he had on hand or was alleging he had on hand uh, for campaign purposes. Uh, this line of credit thing, it, a line of credit is something you get from a bank. You don't create in your head, you know what, I've got some money somewhere. I intend in my brain somewhere to maybe extend that if need be. That's not with the spirit of this law. He had opportunities to explain this in the forums and he admitted no money ever changed hands and he never committed any money to his campaign. You, you take this as to a logical extension. If you get a super rich candidate for office without actually committing any money to their campaign, they can just say they've got a billion dollars on hand, which again, that shows the illogical uh, end result of this excuse. All right, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna skip over the, we've gone in detail of the dates of the transactions. Okay, guardianship case and fees, and this is important because this is what led up to all of this. And it's important for the repayment, or excuse me, the failure to return the actual documents and the records. Uh, the guardianship case cost $80,000 total. April 17, 2015, $20,000 payment. August 8, 2015, $10,000 payment. June 16, 2016, $50,000 payment, where and maybe it's just because I've worked in public service for 20 something years. It is absurd that Judge Coomer, knowing that this has been pending for years, knowing that we've been investigating and this is in the answer for formal charges, has no idea what he did with $50,000. Doesn't pass the smell test. The billing records show that Judge Coomer had not even used the $20,000 before asking for the next 10. Um, <clears throat> he accounts for around $50,000 of actual work, even though he was paid $80,000. And they had claimed in his answer that some of the final $50,000 was for legal, future legal work. We've never really got a clear answer on exactly what that meant. We know the document that he drew up as a client agreement said, any work outside of this guardianship requires a new written agreement. And it was never done. All right. As I said, Noted, you all are the judge of credibility of the witnesses in this case and the parties. And the conduct here, I think, speaks to the credibility uh, of, of the statements from Judge Coomer and what actually happened here. <clears throat> First of all, the role for Judge Coomer being executor, trustee, and beneficiary in violation of bar rules. The fact that he changed the will to make his wife the executor and trustee. The failure to report improper campaign activities. These weren't mistakes, these were decisions he made not to do. Uh, he listed Phil Hart's property as security for the loans twice. The loans were to CAC and not Judge Coomer, and he did not explain the legal significance to Mr. Phil Hart. What he failed to provide I APS, and the records you got there for APS, he provided the emails from Mr. Phil Hart on February 22nd, 2018, or 2019 and February 28th. He did not include his own emails, his own emails responding because they look bad because he's accusing Mr. Phil Hart of having mental problems and not wanting to live in that type of thing. He refused to return records and respond to emails. Uh, his statement to write about changing the terms of the will when confronted and then hanging up on them. Emails in 2000, I'm sorry. I, I know there was a discussion between yes. Judge Coomer and Mr. Gammon about changing the terms of the loan. Hey, just put a different address. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. You're, that's that's a, a an error on my part. It should say loan, not will. Okay. I, yes. If there was also no. will, I just wanted to be reminded I, of that. I don't think they got into that. No, you're absolutely right. Um, emails in 2019 regarding the 2018 loan and the tax implication discussions. Testimony about Phil Hart wanting to offload money from the Teamsters account. You heard Mr. Phil Hart and the, the genuineness and the, the responsiveness of him in here was, was interesting. It was like, I don't need anybody to hold my money. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, of course, Mr. Coomer asked him for the loans. He gladly and willingly gave him the loans. He absolutely did. We've never contested that he came in and forced him to give him these loans or anything like that. However, you have to consider the relationship of these parties. You have to consider the, the terms of the loans in showing how unfair and unreasonable this was. And again, that's the last bullet point, in terms of the loan. <clears throat> All right, just a couple of the, uh, the respondents' arguments. I, I, I 
wanted to note some of these things to uh, so I remember to talk about them before I, I sit down. Um, okay, Mr. Gammon's phone call. Um, we talked about, we know there's an email and we know there's a phone call. Mr. Gammon said he thought it was two. This was several years ago. He's definitely, he remembers a phone call where Judge Coomer hung up because he knew and it stuck out in his mind. Uh, crud, I'm going to have to sue a court of appeals judge. Um, <clears throat> people wanted to get their name in the newspaper. I, I, I don't know who he's talking about. I don't know if he's insinuating us, uh, me. I, I can assure you this, three months into this job, a week after the pandemic sitting in, the last thing anybody on earth would want to have to do is take on the task of looking into a sitting court of appeals judge, former floor leader, former state representative, and have to deal with allegations of judicial misconduct. Uh, talks about Mr. Tillhart not being hurt by uh, Judge Coomer's actions. Well, one, his money left his possession and went to somebody else. Two, you heard from Mr. Alford, from Investigator Alford, um, and from Mr. Gammon about how this, it, it had torn up Mr. Philhart. He didn't know what to do about it. He was upset about the loans. He felt like he was taken advantage of. And he was really torn about how to deal with what had happened with Judge Coomer. He was never, I'm wanting to go get, you know, uh, get, get justice and ruin him. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but that's just not, not the truth. Um, did not tell... Uh, the, the statement was that uh, he did not tell all, investigator offer that he did nothing wrong was only mad about taxes that investigator offer told you Mr. Gamma told you about what he said and how he described how he felt about it absolutely was the tax issue the final straw that set him off and made him upset absolutely having to pay eleven thousand dollars in taxes because you loan somebody who's a state rep and now a, you know, a, a court of appeals judge, $130,000 with no interest until 2026, of course that's going to set you off. But then you've also got the email even before that from January, where he starts doubting Judge Coomer's uh, terms of the loans he's given him. And the fact that his investment advisor told him that this was a dumb move, basically. Um, and what do we hear immediately after that? Judge Coomer went to go talk to him. And the next thing you know, Mr. Phil Hart's getting invited over for dinner for the first time a few weeks later. Um, they, they, I guess, in their clo uh, closing argument, uh, addressed and criticized the fact that we argued that Mr. Phil Hart remembered better when he was talking to people in 2020. If you've been involved in the justice system and you've seen real life with witnesses testifying, this is the least surprising thing in the history of Earth. Um, with prior, in, in, prior inconsistent and prior consistent statements being necessary to show what's happened. That's why you ask people questions to get answers closer in time to the actual events. And from the witness stand, we had the statements from a testimony of Investigator Alford about what Mr. Phil Hart said back in 2020, statements to Mr. Gammon about what he said back in 2020. And then we had Mr. Uh, uh, Judge Bryson talking about the monthly payments um, and that was kind of off the cuff about, you know, he was like, yeah, he, he said he wasn't making his monthly payments or this or that. Um, who knows if Mr. Bryson is remembering that wrong? I don't, I don't think any of the evidence from Investigator Alford, from Mr. Gammon, he had never said that to anybody, that he didn't make the payments on time. Nobody has ever contested that. We all know, and the evidence shows, that Mr. Coomer made his payments to Mr. Phil Hart on time. Okay, K. Smith saying that uh, Mr. Philhart told her he was going to ruin her. Well, investigator offer told you that never statement was never made to him when he interviewed her two years ago. Also, we found out that she actually called Mr. Philhart because she heard what had happened and she felt bad for him because he's a lonely person. He had no other friends, which is exactly why he was the mark in this case. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Lefko said that uh, uh, Mr. Phil Hart was just a pawn, I guess, in everybody's conspiracy to get Judge Coomer. I, I guess from us to um, Mr. Gammon, I guess he was just looking to make a quick buck is their theory with no proof. Um, I, I think that's an absurd statement. Mr. 
Coomer and the defense has argued their own. Oh, you can't tell Jim Philhart to do anything. So for them to get up here and tell you he was a pawn of the state or a pawn of Mr. Gammon is ludicrous. Um, discussing friends, y'all saw Mr. Philhart. You got to see his personality. You got to see how he operates. And you've heard about him from several other witnesses. You heard about him from Mr. Coomer. You heard about him from Kay Smith. He never went to coffee with him. He never went to dinner with him. Mr. Philhart told you when I saw him, it would be, I would be going by to talk to him about legal issues because it's obvious Mr. Philhart always had something going on with either Mr. Cool or um, another business or a will for one of his friends or the guardianship. This was not a two-way friendship where you would say they're best friends hanging out all the time. You heard from the other witnesses describing how Mr. Philhart because somebody did a little work for them or something, thought they were like best friends. And it just, it just wasn't the case here. <clears throat> um, the argument that Mr. Philhart loaned unsecured money, uh, unsecured, made unsecured loans before. Um, I guess that's defense saying he made bad business transactions with other people. So that's that somehow excuse Judge Coomers, which is not appropriate. Um, that's an interesting question you asked defense counsel about when did the representation stop? The representation at a minimum didn't stop uh, until after he had been appointed to office because he wrote that will for him on September the 19th, making himself the beneficiary. And also, and I think y'all, one of the hearing panel, I can't remember which one it was, noted from looking at the emails, it appears that Judge Coomer was actually giving him legal advice on dealing with Mr. Cool and it drafted something for him. He shouldn't have been doing legal uh, work, but I mean, that's, Another thing where he's still giving him uh, advice on how to handle legal matters. Um, they argued about Fran Bragg and the will that she was executor and trustee on. Um, it, of note, and I noted this with Mr. Bryson, who also, or Judge Bryson, who noted, yeah, when he asked me to be a beneficiary, I knew full well I couldn't do that. Um, also, because of these handwritten lists that Mr. Phil Hart liked to do, he included that in the will, in the will that Mr. Coomer had reviewed before he started drafting them. And the handwritten lists were notated in those wills. Of note, Judge Coomer, the ones that he drafted were not noted in the wills that he drafted. Uh, Fran Bragg also was not the beneficiary on that specific will. She may have been executor and trustee, but she was not the beneficiary on that, that will. Okay. <clears throat> Regardless of what Mr. Uh, Coomer put in the emails initially about Mr. Phil Hart's mental stability. Um, that was a comment that was made, like regardless of that, you can't disregard those emails from February 22nd and February 28th. Um, argument was made that they resolved the issue with CFC and um, that they withdrew the charge because it was not clear. There was no testimony that this, I think that was in regard to the $50,000 loan, um, that it was not clear. You heard the testimony and from Mr. Lane and him explaining, it was plea negotiations, basically. They were negotiating how to resolve the case. You give a little, you take a little, and that's what they did. Um, statement was made about uh, in uh, the word liquidate and how I used the term liquidate uh, involving Mr. Philhart selling his stocks. Well, yes, he did liquidate them. He got the cash and he gave them to Judge Coomer. So yes, he effectively liquidated his stocks because the money went to Judge Coomer. Um, materiality under the federal statute. Um, again, the only reason that federal statute was in there because he signed a notice saying he knew he was not supposed to make uh, improper statements on his loan application. All right, so the matter of discipline. Um, you know, <clears throat> under the statute and our rules and in, in the amended formal charges, there are basically two prongs that we have as far as um, discipline. Uh, we've got willful misconduct in office, which is noted in the formal charge, and conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice such that it brings the judicial office into disrepute. Obviously, the second one is the main one. Um, the first one, however, several of the counts in here were when he was in judicial office, after he had taken judicial office. So that applies to some of the offenses as well. Now, um, <clears throat> there were 
Uh, I know Mr. Cathy was very eloquent in making his uh, uh, closing argument part about, you know, bar violations and how you uh, handle attorneys in certain situations with attorney discipline. Um, there are several, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of done a review of how other courts uh, view this and that different relationship uh, and that different standard for a judge, even in regard and in juxtaposition of an attorney. Um, Inquiry concerning a judge, which is Henson, 913 Southern 2nd, 572, it's a Florida 2005 case. Judges should be held to even stricter ethical standards than attorneys, because in the nature of things, even more rectitude and uprightness is expected of them. The judge should observe high standards of conduct so that the integrity and independence of the judiciary may be preserved. He should conduct themselves at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary. Again, the bar disciplinary commit, uh, group can do what they're gonna do. That is completely different than when you're dealing with a sitting judge who is subject to public scrutiny. Um, just and again, while I'm thinking about it, I know uh, Mr. Cathy talked about the fact that, you know, some of these, um, or a lot of these bar violations would only be public reprimands. And I think that really points out in isolation, one violation of 1.8 C, possibly, yeah, public reprimand. What they're not mentioning is in the context of a bar disciplinary proceeding though, if you have multiple offenses or continuing offenses, that changes the dynamics, especially um, when you've got repeated misconduct over years. So just to say, to kind of, okay, Maybe that in a bar disciplinary uh, matter, one isolated violation would be a public reprimand. That's apples to oranges with what we have here. And we are dealing with the code of judicial conduct in a completely different organization in a completely different purposed agency. <clears throat> okay. Some of the other things to consider when you're considering discipline. Uh, the nature, extent, and frequency. We've had a lot of complaints about how big this answer to the amended formal charges are and the number of uh, counts in the indictment, uh, the extent of it. That's not my fault. That's Judge Coomer's fault. Those are his actions which caused all of those charges. The extent, not only drafting improper wills, not only borrowing money on unfair and unreasonable terms from a client, not only in his behavior of refusing to return that man's records and how he dealt with them, not only in dealing with the transfer of funds between his campaign and his law firm, and then using campaign funds to benefit himself and his family. That's extent, that's frequency. The fact that he injured the trust with Mr. Philhart, this was his client he'd built this trust with, <clears throat> And he has injured the respect for the judiciary. These are considerations. Did, was there injury to somebody involved? Was there injury uh, for respect to the judiciary? And there should be no doubt here that the judiciary has been impacted with a court of appeals judge with statewide jurisdiction, uh, having been proven of all of these violations. At a minimum, if you take everything that they said at face value and everything true, nothing that we've said, said is true, he told you himself, I'm not saying I didn't commit malpractice. At a minimum, he is so negligent in knowing the law. How can the public trust him to sit on the court of appeals? They can't. He exploited his position of trust. That is a consideration as far as discipline. And the fact that he repeatedly violated bar rules, the code of judicial conduct, and Georgia law. How will the public ever have public confidence that he's going to enforce the rules when he can't follow the rules himself? A couple of other, you know, because obviously the people who, who write these opinions in other states are much more eloquent than I am. Um, I noted some when I was looking through um, some, some other cases dealing with uh, judges' behavior toward clients, uh, toward campaign finance uh, uh, violations, and I, I pull a couple of things. Um, one, in Ray inquiry concerning a judge, 174 Southern 3rd, 364, Florida 2015 case. 
A pattern of deceit and deception casts serious doubt on a judge's ability to be perceived as truthful by those who may appear before her in her courtroom. Further, such conduct diminishes the public's confidence in the integrity of the judicial system. Under those circumstances, removal from judicial office is appropriate. In this case, Judge Coomer repeatedly failed to disclose improper campaign conduct between his firm and his uh, campaign. And we, when you're talking about, you know, it, and I really think, you know, this makes the situation even more egregious. Yesterday, we found out that evidently we've got these different accounts and we, we got the account balances. He didn't have the money to make these transfers from his other account. He used his campaign account. But he evidently at times had $10,000 in a safe somewhere. And he made the decision, somebody with the opportunity and the means, if we believe him on that, which we have deposits of cash, he made the decision not to use his own money and to move the campaign funds over to float the law firm. Using campaign funds for family trips, failing to disclose that as required, violating bar rules. Really, I'm, I'm, I am beating the dead horse at this point. Um, he, he didn't tell Mr. Philhart the significance of the loan being made to, to CAC. How should we weigh what appears to be the case, which is mm -hmm. um, while there were many different steps to the malpractice or mistreatment or whatever term you might use, mm -hmm. we're not there yet, um, with Mr. Philhart, that does seem to be the one situation, not one instance, because there right. were multiple, three loans, multiple wills, right. all the things that you've documented mm -hmm. and we've heard about, many of which Judge Coomer's admitted to, but it's Mr. Philhart and not through the good investigative work of, of Mr. Alford and others, here comes a whole train of mm -hmm. former clients and it happened to me too, right. it happened to me too. In fact, the only other people we've heard from who interacted professionally with Judge Coomer, and we had the opposite experience. And frankly, Mr. Philhart didn't say I had a bad experience. Mm -hmm. Well, there were many amazing things he did, in particular the guardianship. But it is one mm -hmm. bad relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and your take on it is it was a predatory or exploitative relationship in a way that financially benefited Judge Coomer and his family, mm -hmm. et cetera, or could have. Right. Um, beyond the loans that were repaid. Um, but it's still one client when Judge Coomer was essentially a practicing attorney, a little bit spills over to when he's a judge. How does that one versus you're showing us 10 clients, which would be a clear case of as a lawyer, he was a bad egg, shouldn't be a judge removed from office. Um, there seem to be many examples of when as a lawyer, a legislator, um, active duty soldier, if you will, um, did a great job. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're focused on um, with that lawyer client relationship one, um, and yet you're advocating for removal as opposed mm -hmm. to something still severe, mm -hmm. but not, you can't be a judge anymore. Right, and I think it's the level and nature of it. The, the position of this specific victim, as opposed to others, this specific client, um, an elderly man, who he'd built this trust with, that he'd taken hundreds of thousand dollars in loans, the way he'd structure the loans in the wills, uh, I think that is it. And then how he reacted and the, the response when Mr. Philhart asked for his records and that type of thing. I think that within that relationship, make much like I think the Judge Norris case where when it initially came back from the Supreme Court, they were like, okay, tell us how one circumstance makes this something that needs to be disciplined. I think in that regard- I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. My question was, mm -hmm. gosh, should there be discipline? But yep. um, yeah. you're asking for the maximum. Mm -hmm. And what we need to be thinking about mm -hmm. is um, the spectrum. Right. And so if what happened in this case, if we were to find the facts in the favor and the light mm -hmm. most favorable to what you've been mm -hmm. presenting, then um, for someone who did that to two clients, there's no question what mm -hmm. we would have to remove that person mm -hmm. because they did more, if mm -hmm. you will. So that, right. that quantum of malfeasance mm -hmm. would be greater. And so we need to be careful that if we are saying this 
conduct falls into the category of you need to be removed from office. Um, we, we aren't drawing a line in such a way that, oh, but these three other things were so right. far worse, we're just handing out the same penalty again. Right. And I, I think it is, it's A, the vulnerability of the particular client, but I think it is B, the, the extent and repeated uh, contact over the time with the client. I think it is also um, <clears throat> the, uh, we aren't looking at this just as the Mr. Philhart uh, occasion. And I think that is also something, you know, not just the extent, not just the number of times, not just, you know, well, the, I mean, the, a lot of times the Supreme Court, we know how they look at, you do funny money with your client, you know, that's almost always you're, you're you know, you're gonna get in big, big trouble. Um, but here we've got repeated violations of the campaign finance law as well. You know, we've got these things that happened when he was a judge and when he was within his firm. And so I think it's you have to take it all into context and the behavior, uh, what it shows. There, there is just no way um, we believe that he can sit with the public having confidence while he's on the bench. So one more question on that. Yes, I, I'm taking up a little bit of your time, so we'll give you maybe an extra minute. Um, but how do we how do you recommend we think through the fundamentally different role Judge Coomer has as a judge from a trial judge, because those quotes mm -hmm. that you read, very powerful, and I think mm -hmm. on point, really, you're thinking of the prototypical, mm -hmm. I'm the judge dispensing justice, and so you have to, but when I rule this way, or I tell you mm -hmm. this person wasn't credible, and this and that, Judge Coomer's not going to act alone. He's going to act mm -hmm. in a group of three or larger as mm -hmm. a court of appeals judge. He's not receiving evidence in the way that a trial judge would. It's, it's a, it's a different role. Mm -hmm. and I'm not suggesting there should be different standards. Some would say it should be a higher standard because it's a higher court. I'm wondering if it is ought to be thought about in a slightly different way, not lower or higher, but different because the role of an appellate judge is different from the role of a frontline judge. I think that's a that's actually a great point. Um, and I think some of the slides from uh, respondents counsel really drive it home talking about how many opinions he's authored, how many opinions he's been a part of. Um, is he going to dissent on one? And as a court of appeals judge, he's not just one of the a judge that's focused on one particular area. He is dealing with probate matters, estate matters, possibly campaign finance, business matters. And so I think in that regard, it could be even more, the, the public scrutiny is going to be even greater in dealing with these types of, of decisions being made by a court of appeals judge that encompass so many different things, much like the amended formal charges, which encompass so many different things. Um, and so, you know, a couple of things, just some statements about uh, the, the ethics uh, issues as far as campaign finance. <clears throat> um, one case, in Ray. Disciplinary Proceedings of Coleman's 2019, Oklahoma 77, 2019 case. A um, couple of statements from that case. Ethics Commission rules governing campaign financing and reporting protect the integrity of the election process. Compliance with these rules is a duty that every candidate, especially candidates for judicial office, owes to the people, the electorate, and the state. Um, in that case, they noted, while Judge Coleman's efforts to rectify her delinquent report is commendable, they do not relieve her of accountability and discipline for a serious violation of the Code of Judicial Conduct. And I say that to note, you know, when did Judge Coomer try to attempt to rectify these? After he got caught. And when he knew we were investigating and had financial records is when he had his attorney go in and do an audit and like, hey, yeah, there may be some stuff in the, the American Express accounts. It was obviously obvious to his attorney that this was problematic and not just something, oh, that's not a problem, this is normal. Um, a judicial officer who has so little regard for both the state's election laws and the obligations of a witness who signs the equivalent of an, af of an affidavit is not a fit person to administer oaths and cannot be trusted to faithfully uphold the laws. If this were, and, and you heard from uh, Mr. Lane and you actually heard it from Mr. Coomer uh, yesterday, in the campaign financing uh, uh, allegations initially, there were other allegations in there. Within this, it is focused in on specific ones. 
And if it was one that there was just, ah, I made a mistake, I shouldn't have sent that over, I, I sent it back, we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't be here on those specific types of charges. But here it was repeated conduct. You know, finally, the judicial system can only function if the public is able to put its trust in judicial officers. And I think it's important to note, I think they mentioned this, what, you know, it's important to, to, to look at and see what people are doing when no one is looking. And I think in this case, you've got the juxtaposition about how Judge Coomer um, acted publicly doing volunteer service. And that's very, I mean, that's commendable that he did that. Um, he had a distinguished, uh, had distinguished years of service uh, in the state House of Representatives, um, and then as a Court of Appeals judge. But what did he do with Mr. Phil Hart when people weren't looking? What did he do when the Ethics Commission wasn't looking? And I think that right there is the reason that I think removal is the only appropriate sanction in this case because of the extent, nature, and frequency of the violations that you have before you uh, that have been proven by clear and convincing evidence. And unless you have any other questions, that's all I have. Thank you. So I want to take a moment of personal privilege to thank all the participants for their hard work in this matter, um, and also to note, because it bears noting, that um, this case has put an extraordinary and in some ways unnecessary burden on the director's team, on Judge Coomer and Judge Coomer's team, because it has stayed out here for so long. Um, and that is not the fault of any one individual, but the hearing panel um, has um, not been in a position to move with all deliberate speed on this case. Um, we are now able to do that. Um, we have been able to add some legal resources, uh, but for many months, the responsibility for tackling complicated issues like um, whether prejudicial conduct is properly within the ambit of the JQC um, fell on the shoulders of judges and lawyers with full-time demanding jobs. And again, not an excuse, but an explanation. Judge Kumar, it was very moving to hear yesterday how this has impacted you and the fact that you have been waiting now for two years to get an answer to what's next um, is not appropriate and you should get an answer sooner than that. Um, it is not the director's fault or his team. Um, again, it's not one individual's fault, but the process ought to move faster and it hasn't. And that means that the director is out having to answer questions about why can't you do something with this Court of Appeals case? And his <coughs> response is, I've done what I can and we've teed this case up. And you're um, looking to your lawyer saying, why can't we do something with these charges that are pending? Um, and they did everything they could to move it along. Maybe they could have made less good and difficult arguments and it would have moved faster, but they were doing their job by um, making those arguments. So I, I just want to note that. And with that comes the commitment that we will deliver a thoughtful and reasoned R&R to the Supreme Court promptly. Um, this will not languish. Uh, we're going to meet in just a few moments to begin our discussions and our thoughts. We will reach out to both sides if there's anything we need. It may be a question to one side, but we'll let both sides know we have a question. Um, we will resist the need to say we need a formal written submission, but we may ask the two sides to point us towards an exhibit if we're remembering, wait, someone talked about X. Um, and if we need help finding X, we'll let both sides know that we're on the hunt for X. And then both sides will get a chance via email. If you could put something in more formal written format, you're welcome to do that. But we don't envision saying we need 20 pages on this issue. Um, what were the alleged campaign finance violations? We've received far more than 20 pages worth of testimony and written pleadings. I think we're good to go there. Um, but we will not hesitate to ask if it will allow us to answer sooner. Um, but that is our commitment. Um, and uh, we do intend to get something to the Supreme Court um, promptly. Um, so thank you again for weeks and months of service on behalf of the public and the JQC, on behalf of Judge Coomer. 
Um, and I want to make sure my colleagues have a chance to add anything else they want to add before we adjourn. Ms. Lopez. Hard act to follow. Um, I too want to commend the parties on putting together very compelling cases. And this is, this, these are difficult issues and obviously hundreds of exhibits. And I know how difficult it can be to put these things together. And I appreciate how prepared each of the parties were. And, and um, it's, you know, I've served a long time on the bench and uh, I always appreciated when lawyers were ready to go and were prepared to do their record. So thank you all for, for that. It makes our lives easier. Um, you have made our lives easier in that respect. You've made it harder with your great arguments. Uh, we have a lot to consider. Uh, I also do hope that everyone has a wonderful and safe holiday season. Happy Hanukkah for those who celebrate, including myself. And uh, Merry Christmas to all and Happy New Year. We will hopefully have something for you all in the new year. Definitely, we'll have something. For you. Mr. Winter. I'm on the, all right. I'd like to echo some of the comments already made. I am the citizen member of this panel. I am not a trained attorney, neither am I an experienced judge, but I will tell each and every person here that is listening to what I have to say that the presentations were very professional. I was impressed by both teams, their thoroughness and going through the details and the facts. Uh, I personally feel like I have an excellent understanding of a complex very complex situation involving a number of years. Those of you that might know a little bit about my background, I did serve uh, on the Judicial Qualifications Commission as a member for about eight years. Yes, I participated in hearings. Yes, I participated back in those days. We were both the, the judge, the prosecutor, the investigator, we were all in one unit. Those, those procedures have changed uh, to, to, I believe, a better, more fair process that we are involved in today. But I will tell you that um, the cases that I was involved with uh, during my tenure on the JQC did not involve the complexity and the issues that we are addressing today. And again, uh, I feel like that both teams did a superior job in presenting the facts with witnesses and evidence that have enabled me to have a very keen understanding of the issues, both pro and con on each and in every one of the counts. So I'd like to express my appreciation for the effort each one of y'all have put into this. It's been certainly to my benefit. Thank you. Mr. Boring, anything else from the director's side? Uh, for the record, I, I mentioned those uh, bank records, uh, original flash drives put in to be under seal eventually. Uh, I would ask to admit exhibits 293 through 296 at this time. So those are the original unredacted bank records that contain, in some of them, the areas of concern that Mr. Lefkoe prescribed. Correct. Uh, 293 is the SWBC mortgage record. 294 UCB, all the bank records, 295 UBS records, and 296 the American Express. Any objection to having those admitted but remaining under seal? Is it right? No objection. Okay, they're admitted. Anything else? I have a copy of exhibit 378. Okay, I'm going to get to you in that. Um, Mr. Boring, anything else? No. Okay. Mr. Left, we've got a copy on the exhibit. Uh, exhibit 378, which was yesterday. Um, it was digital only yesterday. Okay. Can I put that in the stack? Yeah, I don't know <laughs> what that box is or why the stuff's not in there, but let's put it next to it. All the original evidence in the evidence box. Great. Great. Anything else? Sir? <coughs> no, you're right. Okay. Um, well, then, with that, we are adjourned. Uh, you get out of here before the roads crisp up tonight. So, drive safely, everyone. And as uh, Judge Lopez mentioned, have safe and happy holiday, however you choose to celebrate. Thank you very much. Happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas.